chapter seventeen of cleopatra by gay org ebers translated by mary j safford this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen cleopatra had sought the venerable anubis who now as the priest of alexander at the age of eighty ruled the whole hierarchy of the country it was difficult for him to leave his armchair but he had been carried to the observatory to examine the adverse result of the observation made by the queen herself the position of the stars however had been so unfavourable that the more deeply cleopatra entered into these matters the less easy he found it to urge the mitigating influences of distant planets which he had at first pointed out in his reception hall however the chief priest had assured her that the independence of egypt and the safety of her own person lay in her hands only the planet showed this a terrible sacrifice was required a sacrifice of which his dignity his eighty years and his love for her alike forbade him to speak cleopatra was accustomed to hear these mysterious sayings from his lips and interpreted them in her own way many motives had induced her to seek the venerable prelate at this late hour in difficult situations he had often aided her with good counsel but this time she was not led to him by the magic cup of nectanibus which the eight pastophori who accompanied it had that day restored to the temple for since the battle of actium the superb vessel had been a source of constant anxiety to her cleopatra had now asked the teacher of her childhood the direct question whether the cup a wide shallow vessel with a flat polished bottom could really have induced antony to leave the battle and follow her ere the victory was decided she had used it just before the conflict between the galleys and this circumstance led anubis to answer positively in the affirmative long ago the marvellous chalice had been exhibited to her among the temple treasures and she was told that every one who induced another person to be reflected from its shining surface obtained the mastery over his will her wish to possess it however was not gratified and she did not ask for it again until the limitless devotion and ardent love of antony had seemed less fervent than of yore from that time she had never ceased to urge her aged friend to place the wondrous cup in her keeping at first he had absolutely refused predicting that its use would bring misfortune upon her but when her request was followed by an imperative command and the goblet was entrusted to her anubis himself believed that this one vessel did possess the magic power attributed to it he deemed that the drinking cup afforded the strongest proof of the magic art far transcending human ability of the great goddess by whose aid king nectanibus who according to tradition was the father of alexander the great was said to have made the vessel in the isis island of philae anubis had intended to remind cleopatra of his refusal and show her the great danger incurred by mortals who strove to use powers beyond their sphere it had been his purpose to bid her remember phaeton who had almost kindled a conflagration in the world when he attempted in the chariot of his father phoebus apollo to guide the horses of the sun but this was unnecessary for he had scarcely assented to the question ere with passionate vehemence she ordered him to destroy before her eyes the cup which had brought so much misfortune the priest feigned that her desire harmonized with a resolution which he had himself formed in fact before her arrival he had feared that the goblet might be used in some fatal manner if octavianus should take possession of the city and country and the wonder-working vessel should fall into his hands nectanibus had made the cup for egypt to wrest it from the foreign ruler was acting in the spirit of the last king in whose veins had flowed the blood of the pharaohs and who had toiled with enthusiastic devotion for the independence and liberty of his people 
to destroy this man's marvellous work rather than deliver it to the roman conqueror seemed to the chief priest after the queen's command a sacred duty and as such he represented it to be when he commanded the smelting furnace to be fired and the cup transformed into a shapeless mass before the eyes of cleopatra while the metal was melting he eagerly told the queen how easily she could dispense with the vessel which owed its magic power to the mighty isis the spell of woman's charms was also a gift of the goddess it would suffice to render antony's heart soft and yielding as the fire melted the gold perhaps the imperator had forfeited with the queen's respect her love the most priceless of blessings he anubis would regard this as a great boon of the deity for he concluded mark antony is the cliff which will shatter every effort to secure to my royal mistress undiminished the heritage which has come to her and her children from their ancestors and preserve the independence and prosperity of this beloved land this cup was a costly treasure the throne and prosperity of egypt are worthy of greater sacrifices but i know that there is none harder for a woman to make than her love the meaning of the old man's words cleopatra learned the following morning when she granted the first interview to timogenes octavianus's envoy the keen-witted brilliant man who had been one of her best teachers and with whom when a pupil she had had many an argument was kindly received and fulfilled his commission with consummate skill the queen listened attentively to his representations showed him that her own intellect had not lost in flexibility though it had gained power and when she dismissed him with rich gifts and gracious words she knew that she could preserve the independence of her beloved native land and retain the throne for herself and her children if she would surrender antony to the conqueror or to him as the person acting or these were timogenes's own words remove him for ever from the play whose end she had the power to render either brilliant or fateful when she was again alone her heart throbbed so passionately and her soul was in such a tumult of agitation that she felt unable to attend the appointed meeting of the council of the crown she deferred the session until the following day and resolved to go out upon the sea to endeavour to regain her composure antony had refused to see her this wounded her the thought of the goblet and its evil influences had by no means passed from her memory with the destruction of the vessel caused by one of those outbursts of passion to which in these days of disaster she yielded more frequently than usual on the contrary she felt the necessity of being alone to collect her thoughts and strive to dispel the clouds from her troubled soul the beaker had been one of the treasures of isis and the memory of it recalled hours during which in former days she had often found composure in the temple of the goddess she wished to seek the sanctuary unnoticed and accompanied only by iris and the chief introducer went closely veiled to the neighbouring temple at the corner of the muses but she failed to find the object of her pilgrimage the throng which filled it to pray and offer sacrifices and the fear of being recognised destroyed her calmness she was in the act of retiring when gorgias the architect followed by an assistant carrying surveying instruments advanced towards her she instantly called him to her side and he informed her how wonderfully fate itself seemed to favour her plan of building the mob had destroyed the house of the old philosopher didymus and the grey-haired sage to whom he had offered the shelter of his home was now ready to transfer the property inherited from his ancestors if her majesty would assure him and his family of her protection then she asked to see the architect's plan for joining the museum to the sanctuary and became absorbed in the first sketch to which he had devoted part of the night and morning he showed it and with eager urgency cleopatra commanded him to begin the building as soon as possible and pursue the work night and day what usually required months must be completed in weeks 
iris and the introducer clad in plain garments had waited for her in the temple court and joined by the architect accompanied her to the unpretending litter standing at one of the side gates but instead of entering it she ordered gorgias to attend her to the garden the inspection proved that the architect was right and even if the mausoleum occupied a portion of it and the street which separated it from the temple of isis were continued along the shore of the sea the remainder would still be twice as large as the one belonging to the palace at lochias cleopatra's thorough examination showed gorgias that she had some definite purpose in view her inquiry whether it would be possible to connect it with the promontory of lochias indicated what she had in mind and the architect answered in the affirmative it was only necessary to tear down some small buildings belonging to the crown and a little temple of berenike at the southern part of the royal harbour the arm of the agathodamon canal which entered here had been bridged long ago the new scene which would result from this change had been conjured before the queen's mental vision with marvellous celerity and she described it in brief vivid language to the architect the garden should remain but must be enlarged from the lochias to the bridge thence a covered colonnade would lead to the palace after gorgias had assured her that all this could easily be arranged she gazed thoughtfully at the ground for a time and then gave orders that the work should be commenced at once and requested him to spare neither means nor men gorgias foresaw a period of feverish toil but it did not daunt him with such a master builder he was ready to roof the whole city besides the commission delighted him because it proved that the woman whose mausoleum was to rise from the earth so swiftly still thought of enhancing the pleasures of existence for though she wished the garden to remain unchanged she desired to see the colonnade and the remainder of the work constructed of costly materials and in beautiful forms when she bade him farewell gorgias kissed her robe with ardent enthusiasm what a woman true she had not even raised her veil and was attired in plain dark clothing but every gesture revealed the most perfect grace the arm and hand with which she pointed now here now there again seemed to him fairly instinct with life and he who deemed perfection a form of so much value found it difficult to avert his eyes from her marvellous symmetry and her whole figure what lines what genuine aristocratic elegance and warm throbbing life that morning when helena now an inmate of his own home greeted him he had essayed to compare her mentally with cleopatra but speedily desisted the man to whom hebe proffers nectar does not ask for even the best wine of biblis a feeling of grateful cheerful satisfaction difficult to describe stole over him when the reserved quiet helena addressed him so warmly and cordially but the image of cleopatra constantly thrust itself between them and it was difficult for him to understand himself he had loved many women in succession and now his heart throbbed for two at once and the queen was the brighter of the two stars whose light entranced him therefore his honest soul would have considered it a crime to woo helena now cleopatra knew what an ardent admirer she had won in the able architect and the knowledge pleased her she had used no goblet to gain him doubtless he would begin to build the mausoleum the next morning the vault must have space for several coffins antony had more than once expressed the desire to be buried beside her wherever he might die and this had occurred ere she possessed the beaker she must in any case grant him the same favour no matter in what place or by whose hand he met death and the bedimmed light of his existence was but too evidently nearing extinction if she spared him octavianus would strike him from the ranks of the living again she was overpowered by the terrible feverish restlessness which had induced her to command the destruction of the goblet and had brought her to the temple she could not return in this mood to meet her counsellors receive visitors greet her children this was the birthday of the twins charmian had reminded her of it and undertaken to provide the gifts how could she have found time and thought for such affairs 
she had returned from the chief priests late in the evening yet had asked for a minute description of the condition in which they found mark antony the report made by iris harmonized with the state in which she had herself seen him during and after the battle ay his brooding gloom seemed to have deepened charmian had helped her dress in the morning and had been on the point of making her difficult confession and owning that she had aided barine to escape the punishment of her royal mistress but ere she could begin timogenes was announced for cleopatra had not risen from her couch until a late hour the object for which the queen had sought the temple had not been gained but the consultation with gorgias had diverted her mind and the emotions which the thought of her last resting-place had evoked now drowned everything else as the roar of the surf dominates the twittering of the swallows on the rocky shore ay she needed calmness she must weigh and ponder over many things in absolute quietude and this she could not obtain at lochias then her glance rested upon the little sanctuary of berenike which she had ordered removed to make room for a garden near at hand where the children could indulge their love of creative work it was empty she need fear no interruption there the interior contained only a single quiet pleasant chamber with the image of berenike the introducer commanded the guard to admit no other visitors and soon the little white marble circular room with its vaulted roof received the queen she sank down on one of the bronze benches opposite to the statue all was still in this cool silence her mind trained to thought could find that for which it longed clearness of vision a plain understanding of her own feelings and position in the presence of the impending decision at first her thoughts wandered to and fro like a dove ere it chooses the direction of its flight but after the question why she was having a tomb built so hurriedly when she would be permitted to live her mind found the right track among the scythian guards the mauritanians and Lemmies in the army there were plenty of savage fellows whom a word from her lips and a handful of gold would have set upon the vanquished antony as the huntsman's seize him urges the hounds a hint and among the wretched magicians and magians in the rakotis the egyptian quarter of the city twenty men would have assassinated him by poison or wily snares one command to the macedonians in the guard of the malachis or youths and he would be a captive that very day and to-morrow if she so ordered on the way to asia whither octavianus as timogenes told her had gone what prevented her from grasping the goal giving the hint issuing the command doubtless she thought of the magic goblet now melted which had constrained him to cast aside honour fame and power as worthless rubbish in order to obey her behest not to leave her but though this remembrance burdened her soul it had no decisive influence it was no one thing which prisoned her hand and lips but every fibre of her being every pulsation of her heart every glance back into the past to the confines of childhood yet she listened to other thoughts also they reminded her of her children the elation of power love for the land of her ancestors and the peril which menaced it without her the bliss of seeing the light and the darkness the silence the dull rigidity of death the destruction of the body and the mind cherished and developed with so much care and toil the horrible torture which might be associated with the transition from life to death the act of dying and what lay before her in the existence which lasted an eternity when she no longer breathed beneath the sun even if the death hour was deferred and she found that not epicurus who believed that with death all things ended had been right but the ancient teachings of the egyptians what would await her in that world beyond the grave if she purchased a few more years of life by the murder or betrayal of her lover her husband yet perhaps the punishments inflicted upon the condemned were but bugbears invented by the priesthood which guarded the regulation of the state in order to curb the unruly conduct of the populace and terrify the turbulent transgressors of the law and whispered the daring greek spirit in the abode of the condemned not in the garden of alu 
the helysian fields of the egyptians she would meet her father and mother and all her wicked ancestors down to Eurgetes the first who was succeeded by the infamous philopater thus the thought of the other world became an antecedent so uncertain as to permit no definite inference and might therefore be left out of the account how would this must be the form of the question the years purchased by the murder or betrayal of one whom she loved shape themselves for her during the night the image of the murdered man would drive sleep from her couch and the furies the diary and the roman antony call them who pursued murderers with the serpent scourge were no idle creations of poetic fancy but fully symbolized the restlessness of the criminal driven to and fro by the pangs of conscience the chief good the painless happiness of the epicureans was forever lost to those burdened by such guilt and during the hours of the day and evening ay then she would be free to heap pleasure on pleasure but for whom were the festivals to be celebrated with whom could she share them for many a long year no banquet no entertainment had given her enjoyment without mark antony for whom did she adorn herself or strive to stay the vanishing charm and how soon would anguish of soul utterly destroy the spell which was slowly slowly yet steadily diminishing and when the mirror revealed wrinkles which the skill of no olympus could efface when she no she was not created to grow old did the few years of life which must contain so much misery really possess a value great enough to surrender the right of being called by present and future generations the bewitching cleopatra the most irresistible of women and the children yes it would have been delightful to see them grow up and occupy the throne but serious decisive doubts soon blended even with an idea so rich in joy how glorious to greet caesarion as sovereign of the world in octavianus's place but how could the dreamer whose first love affair had caused the total sacrifice of dignity and violation of the law and who now seemed to have once more relapsed into the old state of torpor attain the position the other children inspired fair hopes and how beautiful it appeared to the mother's heart to see antonius helios as king of egypt cleopatra selene with her first child in her arms and little alexander a noble statesman and hero rich in virtue and talents yet what would they antony's children whose education she hoped archibius would direct feel for the mother who had been their father's murderess she shuddered at the thought remembering the hours when her childish heart had shed tears of blood over the infamous mother whom her father had execrated and queen tryphena whom history recorded as a monster had not killed her husband but merely thrust him from the throne arsinoe's execrations of her mother and sister came back to her memory and the thought that the rosy lips of the twins and her darling alexander could ever open to curse her the idea that the children would ever raise their beloved hands to point at her the wicked murderess of their father with horror and scorn no no and again no she would not purchase a few more years of valueless life at the cost of this humiliation and shame purchase of whom of that octavianus who had robbed her son of the heritage of his father caesar and whose mention in the will was like an imputation on her fidelity the cold-hearted calculating upstart whose nature from their first meeting in rome had repelled her had repelled rebuffed chilled her of the man by whose cajolery and power her husband for in her own eyes and those of the egyptians antony held this position had been induced to wed his sister octavia and thereby stamp her cleopatra as merely his love cast a doubt upon legitimate birth of her children of the false friend of the trusting antony who before the battle of actium had most deeply humiliated and insulted both on the contrary her royal pride rebelled against obeying the command of such a man to commit the most atrocious deed and from childhood this pride had been as much a part of her nature as her breath and the pulsation of her heart and yet for her children's sake she might perhaps have incurred this disgrace had it not been at the same time the grave of the best and noblest things which she desired to implant in the young souls of the twins and alexander 
while thinking of the children's curses she had risen from her seat why should she reflect and consider longer she had found the clear perception she sought let gorgias hasten the building of the tomb should fate demand her life she would not resist if she were permitted to preserve it only at the cost of murder or base treachery her lover's was already forfeited at his side she had enjoyed a radiant glowing peerless bliss of which the world still talked with envious amazement at his side when all was over she would rest in the grave and compel the world to remember with respectful sympathy the royal lovers antony and cleopatra her children should be able to think of her with untroubled hearts and not even the shadow of a bitter feeling a warning thought should deter them from adorning their parents graves with flowers weeping at its foot invoking and offering sacrifices to their spirits then she glanced at the statue of berenike who had also once worn on her brow the double crown of egypt she too had early died a violent death she too had known how to love the vow to sacrifice her beautiful hair to aphrodite if her husband returned uninjured from the syrian war had rendered her name illustrious berenike's hair was still to be seen as a constellation in the night heavens though this woman had sinned often and heavily one act of loyal love had made her an honoured worshipped princess she cleopatra would do something still greater the sacrifice which she intended to impose upon herself would weigh far more heavily in the balance than a handful of beautiful tresses and would comprise sovereignty and life with head erect and a sense of proud self-reliance she gazed at the noble marble countenance of the cyrenian queen ere entering the sanctuary she had imagined that she knew how the criminals whom she had sentenced to death must feel now that she herself had done with life she felt as if she were relieved from a heavy burden and yet her heart ached and especially when she thought of her children she was overwhelmed with the emotion which is the most painful of all forms of compassion pity for herself end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of cleopatra by georg ebers translated by mary j safford this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen when cleopatra left the temple iris marvelled at the change in her appearance the severe tension which had given her beautiful face a shade of harshness had yielded to an expression of gentle sadness that enhanced its charm yet her features quickly brightened as her attendant pointed to the procession which was just entering the forecourt of the palace in alexandria and throughout egypt birthdays were celebrated as far as possible therefore to do honour to the twins the children of the city had been sent to offer their congratulations and at the same time to assure their royal mother of the love and devotion of the citizens the return to the palace occupied only a few minutes and as cleopatra hastily donning festal garments gazed down at the bands of children it seemed as if fate by this fair spectacle had given her a sign of approval of her design she was soon standing hand in hand with the twins upon the balcony before which the procession had halted hundreds of boys and girls of the same age as the prince and princess had flocked thither the former bearing bouquets the latter small baskets filled with lilies and roses every head was crowned with a wreath and many of the girls wore garlands of flowers a chorus of youths and maidens sang a festal hymn beseeching the gods to grant the royal mother and children every happiness the leader of the chorus of girls made a short address in the name of the city and during this speech the children formed in ranks the tallest in the rear the smallest in the front and the others between according to their height the scene resembled a living garden in which rosy faces were the beautiful flowers 
cleopatra thanked the citizens for the charming greetings sent to her by those whom they held dearest and assured them that she returned their love her eyes grew dim with tears as she went with her three children to the throng who offered their congratulations and an unusually pretty little girl whom she kissed threw her arms around her as tenderly as if she were her own mother and how beautiful was the scene when the girls strewed the contents of their little baskets on the ground before her and the boys with many a ringing shout and loving wish offered the bouquets to her and the twins charmian had not forgotten to provide the gifts and when the chamberlains and waiting women led the children into a large hall to offer them refreshments the queen's eyes sparkled so brightly that the companion of her childhood ventured to make her difficult confession and as so often happens the event we most dread shows when it actually occurs a friendly or indifferent aspect this was the case now nothing in life is either great or small the one may be transformed to the other according to the things with which it is compared the tallest man becomes a dwarf beside a rocky giant of the mountain chain the smallest is a titan to the swarming ants in the forest the beggar seizes as a treasure what the rich man scornfully casts aside that which the day before yesterday seemed to cleopatra unendurable roused her keenest anxiety robbed her of part of her night's repose and induced her to adopt strenuous measures now appeared trivial and scarcely worthy of consideration yesterday and to-day had brought events and called up questions which forced barine's disappearance into the realm of unimportant matters charmian's confession was preceded by the statement that she longed for rest yet nevertheless was ready to remain with her royal friend in every situation until she no longer desired her services and sent her away but she feared that this moment had come cleopatra interrupted her with the assurance that she was speaking of something utterly impossible and when charmian disclosed barine's escape and admitted that it was she who had aided the flight of the innocent and sorely threatened granddaughter of didymus the queen started up angrily and frowned but it was only for a moment then with a smile she shook her finger at her friend embraced her and gravely but kindly assured her that of all vices ingratitude was most alien to her nature the companion of her childhood had bestowed so many proofs of faithfulness love self-sacrifice and laborious service in her behalf that they could not be long outweighed by a single act of wilful disobedience an abundant supply would still remain by virtue of which she might continue to sin without fearing that cleopatra would ever part from her charmian the latter again perceived that nothing on earth could be hostile or sharp enough to sever the bond which united her to this woman when her lips overflowed with the gratitude which filled her heart cleopatra admitted that it seemed as if in aiding barine's escape she had rendered her a service the caution with which charmian had concealed barine's refuge had not escaped her notice and she did not ask to learn it it was enough for her that the dangerous beauty was out of caesarion's reach as for antony a wall now separated him from the world and consequently from the woman who spite of alexis's accusations had probably never stood closer to his heart charmian now eagerly strove to show the queen what had induced the syrian to pursue barine so vindictively it was evident and scarcely needed proof that mark antony's whole acquaintanceship with the old scholar's granddaughter had been far from leading to any tender relation 
but cleopatra gave only partial attention the man whom she had loved with every pulsation of her heart already seemed to her only a dear memory she did not forget the happiness enjoyed with and through him or the wrong she had done by the use of the magic goblet yet with the wall on the coma which divided him from her and the rest of the world and her command to have the mausoleum built she imagined that the season of love was over any new additions to this chapter of the life of her heart were but the close even the jealousy which had clouded the happiness of her love like a fleeting rapidly changing shadow she believed she had now renounced for ever while charmian protested that no one save dion had ever been heard with favour by barine and related many incidents of her former life cleopatra's thoughts were with antony like the image of the beloved dead the towering figure of the roman hero rose before her mind but she recalled him only as he was prior to the battle of actium she desired and expected nothing more from the broken-spirited man whose condition was perhaps her own fault but she had resolved to atone for her guilt and would do so at the cost of throne and life this settled the account whatever her remaining span of existence might add or subtract was part of the bargain the entrance of alexis interrupted her with fiery passion he expressed his regret that he had been defrauded by base intrigues of the right bestowed upon him to pass sentence upon a guilty woman this was the more difficult to bear because he was deprived of the possibility of providing for the pursuit of the fugitive antony had honoured him with the commission to win herod back to his cause he was to leave alexandria that very night as nothing could be expected in this matter from the misanthropic imperator he hoped that the queen would avenge such an offence to her dignity and adopt severe measures towards the singer and her last lover dion who with sacrilegious hands had wounded the son of caesar but cleopatra with royal dignity kept him within the limits of his position commanded him not to mention the affair to her again and then with a sorrowful smile wished him success with herod in whose return to the lost cause of antony however much as she prized the skill of the mediator she did not believe when he had retired she exclaimed to charmian was i blind this man is a traitor we shall discover it wherever dion has taken his young wife let her be carefully concealed not from me but from this syrian it is easier to defend one's self against the lion than the scorpion you my friend will see that archibius seeks me this very day i must talk with him and you no longer have any thought of a parting another will come soon enough which will forever forbid these lips from kissing your dear face as she spoke she again clasped the companion of her childhood in her arms and when iris entered to request an audience for lucilius antony's most faithful friend cleopatra who had noticed the younger woman's envious glance at the embrace said was i mistaken in fancying that you imagined yourself slighted for charmian who is an older friend that would be wrong for i love and need you both you are her niece and indebted to her for much kindness from your earliest childhood so even though you will lose the joy of revenge upon a hated enemy forget what has happened as i did and maintain your former affectionate companionship i will reward you for it with the only thing that the daughter of the wealthy crates cannot purchase yet which she probably rates at no low value the love of her royal friend 
with these words she clasped iris also in a close embrace and when the latter left the room to summon lucilia she thought no woman has ever won so much love perhaps that is why she possesses so great a treasure of it and can afford such unspeakable happiness by its bestowal or is she so much beloved because she entered the world full of its wealth and dispenses it as the sun diffuses light surely that must be the case i have reason to believe it for whom did i ever love save the queen no one not even myself and i know no one in whose love for me i can believe but why did dion whom i love so fervently disdain me fool why did mark antony prefer cleopatra to octavia who was not less fair whose heart was his and whose hand held the sovereignty of half the world passing on as she spoke she soon returned ushering the roman lucilius into the presence of the queen a gallant deed had bound this man to antony after the battle of philippi when the army of the republicans fled brutus had been on the point of being seized by the enemy's horsemen but lucilius at the risk of being cut down had personated him and thereby though but for a short time rescued him this had seemed to antony unusual and noble and in his generous manner he had not only forgiven him but bestowed his favour upon him lucilius was grateful and gave him the same fidelity he had showed to brutus at actium he had risked antony's favour to prevent his deserting cleopatra after the battle and then accompanied him in his flight now he was bearing him company in his seclusion on the coma the grey-haired man who but a short time before had retained all the vigour of youth approached the queen with bowed head and saddened heart his face so regular in its contours had undergone a marked change within the past few weeks the cheeks were sunken the features had grown sharper and there was a sorrowful expression in the eyes which when informing cleopatra of his friend's condition glittered with tears before the hapless battle he was one of cleopatra's most enthusiastic admirers but since he had been forced to see his friend and benefactor risk fame happiness and honour to follow the queen he had cherished a feeling of bitter resentment towards her he would certainly have spared himself this mission had he not been sure that she who had brought her lover to ruin was the only person who could rouse him from spiritless languor to fresh energy an interest in life from motives of friendship urged by no one he came unbidden to the woman whom he had formerly so sincerely admired to entreat her to cheer the unfortunate man rouse him and remind him of his duty he had little news to impart for on the voyage she had herself witnessed long enough the pitiable condition of her husband now antony was beginning to be content in it and this was what most sorely troubled the faithful friend the imperator had called the little palace which he occupied on the coma his timonium because he compared himself with the famous athenian misanthrope who after fortune abandoned him had also been betrayed by many of his former friends even at tenarum he had thought of returning to the coma and by means of a wall which would separate it from the mainland rendering it as inaccessible as according to rumour the grave of timon at halae near athens gorgias had erected it and whoever wished to visit the hermit was forced to go by sea and request admittance which was granted to few cleopatra listened to lucilius with sympathy and then asked whether there was no way of cheering or comforting the wretched man no your majesty he replied his favourite occupation is to recall what he once possessed but only to show the uselessness of these memories what joys has life not offered me he asks and then adds 
but they were repeated again and again and after being enjoyed for the tenth time they became monotonous and lost their charm then they caused satiety to the verge of loathing only necessary things such as bread and water he says possess real value but he desires neither because he has even less taste for them than for the dainties which spoil a man's morrow yesterday in a specially gloomy hour he spoke of gold this was perhaps most worthy of desire the mere sight of it wakened pleasant hopes because it might afford so many gratifications then he laughed bitterly exclaiming that those joys were the very ones which produced the most disagreeable satiety even gold was not worth the trouble of stretching out one's hand he is fond of enlarging upon such fancies and finds images to make his meaning clear in the snow upon the highest mountain peak the feet grow cold he said in the mire they are warm but the dark mud is ugly and clings to them then i remarked that between the morass and the mountain snows lie sunny valleys where life would be pleasant but he flew into a rage vehemently protesting that he would never be content with the pitiable middle course of horace then he exclaimed i i am vanquished octavianus and his agrippa are the conquerors but if a rock mutilates or an elephant's clumsy foot crushes me i am nevertheless of a higher quality than either there spoke the old mark antony cried cleopatra but again lucilius's loyal heart throbbed with resentment against the woman who had fostered the recklessness which had brought his powerful friend to ruin and he continued but he often sees himself in a different light no writer could invent a more unworthy life than mine he exclaimed recently a farce ending in a tragedy lucilius might have added still harsher sayings but the sorrowful expression in the tearful eyes of the afflicted queen silenced them upon his lips yet cleopatra's name blended with most of the words uttered by the broken-spirited man sometimes it was associated with the most furious reproaches but more frequently with expressions of boundless delight and wild outbursts of fervent longing and this was what inspired lucilius with the hope that the queen's influence would be effectual with his friend therefore he repeated some especially ardent words to which cleopatra listened with grateful joy yet when lucilius paused she remarked that doubtless the misanthropist had spoken of her and probably of octavia also in quite a different way she was prepared for the worst for she was one of the rocks against which his greatness had been shattered this reminded lucilius of the comment antony had made upon the three women whom he had wedded and he answered reluctantly fulvia the wife of his youth i knew the bold hot-blooded woman the former wife of clodius he called the tempest which swelled his sails yes yes cried cleopatra so she did he owes her much but i too am indebted to the dead fulvia she taught him to recognize and yield to woman's power not always to his advantage retorted lucilius whose resentment was revived by the last sentence and without heeding the faint flush on the queen's cheek he added of octavia he said that she was the straight path which leads to happiness and those who are content to walk in it are acceptable to gods and men then why did he not suffer it to content him cried cleopatra wrathfully fulvia's school replied the roman was probably the last where he would learn the moderation which as you know is so alien to his nature his opinion of the quiet valleys and middle course you have just heard but i what have i been to him urged the queen 
lucilius bent his gaze for a short time on the floor then answered hesitatingly you ask to hear and the queen's command must be obeyed he compared your majesty to a delicious banquet given to celebrate a victory at which the guests crowned with garlands revel before the battle which is lost said the queen hurriedly in a muffled voice the comparison is apt now after the defeat it would be absurd to prepare another feast the tragedy is closing so the play doubtless he said so which preceded it would be but a wearisome repetition if performed a second time one thing it is true seems desirable a closing act of reconciliation if you think it is in my power to recall my husband to active life rely upon me the banquet of which he spoke occupied long years the dessert will consume little time but i am ready to serve it when i asked permission to visit him he refused what plan of meeting have you arranged that i will leave to your feminine delicacy of feeling replied lucilius yet i have come with a request whose fulfilment will perhaps contain the answer eros mark antony's faithful body-slave humbly petitions your majesty to grant him a few minutes audience you know the worthy fellow he would die for you and his master and he i once heard from your lips the remark of king antiochus that no man was great to his body-slave thus eros sees his master's weaknesses and lofty qualities from a nearer point of view than we and he is shrewd antony gave him his freedom long ago and if your majesty does not object to receiving a man so low in station let him come replied cleopatra your demand upon me is just unhappily i am but too well aware of the atonement do your friend before you came i was engaged in making preparations for the fulfilment of one of his warmest wishes with these words she dismissed the roman her feelings as she watched his departure were of very mingled character the yearning for the happiness of which she had been so long deprived had again awaked while the unkind words which he had applied to her still rankled in her heart but the door had scarcely closed behind lucilius when the usher announced a deputation of the members of the museum the learned gentlemen came to complain of the wrong which had been done to their colleague didymus and also to express their loyalty during these trying times cleopatra assured them of her favour and said that she had already offered ample compensation to the old philosopher in a certain sense she was one of themselves they all knew that from early youth she had honoured and shared their labours in proof of this she would present to the library of the museum the two hundred thousand volumes from pergamus one of the most valuable gifts mark antony had ever bestowed upon her and which he had hitherto regarded merely as a loan this she hoped would repay didymus for the injury which to her deep regret had been inflicted upon him and at least partially repair the loss sustained by the former library of the museum during the conflagration in the bruchium the sages eagerly assuring her of their gratitude and devotion retired most of them were personally known to cleopatra who to their mutual pleasure and advantage had measured her intellectual powers with the most brilliant minds of their body the sun had already set when a procession of the priests of serapis the chief god of the city whose coming had been announced the day before appeared at lochias accompanied by torch and lantern-bearers it moved forward with slow and solemn majesty in harmony with the nature of serapis there were many reminders of death the meaning of every image every standard every shrine every peculiarity of the music and singing 
was familiar to the queen even the changing colours of the lights referred to the course of growth and decay in the universe and in human life and the magnificent close of the chant of homage which represented the reception of the royal soul into the essence of the deity the apotheosis of the sovereign was well suited to stir the heart for a sea of light unexpectedly flooded the whole procession and while its glow irradiated the huge pile of the palace the sea with its forest of ships and masts and the shore with its temples pylons obelisks and superb buildings all the choruses accompanied by the music of sackbuts cymbals and lutes blended in a mighty hymn whose waves of sound rose to the star-strewn sky and reached the open sea beyond the pharos many a symbolical image suggested death and the resurrection defeat and a victory following it by the aid of great serapis and when the torches retired vanishing in the darkness with the last notes of the chanting of the priests cleopatra raised her head feeling as if the vow she had made during the gloomy singing of the aged men and the extinguishing of the torches had received the approval of the deity brought by her forefathers to alexandria and enthroned there to unite in his own person the nature of the greek and the egyptian gods her tomb was to be built and if destiny was fulfilled to receive her lover and herself she had perceived from antony's bitter words as well as the looks and tones of lucilius that he as well as the man to whom her heart still clung with indissoluble bonds held her responsible for actium and the fall of his greatness the world she knew would imitate them but it should learn that if love had robbed the greatest man of his day of fame and sovereignty that love had been worthy of the highest price the belief which had just been symbolically represented to her that it was allotted to the vanishing light to rise again in new and radiant splendour she would maintain for the present though the best success could scarcely lead to anything more than merely fanning the glimmering spark and deferring its extinction for herself there was no longer any great victory to win which would be worth the conflict yet the weapons must not rest until the end antony must not perish growling like a second timon or a wild beast caught in a snare she would rekindle though but for the last blaze the fire of his hero nature which blind love for her and the magic spell that had enabled her to bind his will had covered for a time with ashes while listening to the resurrection hymn of the priests of serapis she had asked herself if it might not be possible to give antony when he had been roused to fresh energy the son of caesar as a companion in arms true she had found the boy in a mood far different from the one for which she had hoped if he had once been carried on to a bold deed it seemed to have exhausted his energy for he remained absorbed in the most pitiable love-sickness yet he had not recovered from his illness when he was better he would surely wake to active interest in the events which threatened to exert so great an influence on his own existence and like the humblest slave lament the defeat of actium hitherto he had listened to the tidings of battle which had reached his ears with an indifference that seemed intelligible and pardonable only when attributed to his wound his tutor rodan had just requested a leave of absence remarking that caesarion would not lack companions since he was expecting antyllus and other youths of his own age a flood of light streamed from the windows of the reception hall of the king of kings there was still time to seek him and make him understand what was at stake ah if she could but succeed in awaking his father's spirit if that culpable attack should prove the harbinger of future deeds of manly daring 
no interview with him as yet had encouraged this expectation but a mother's heart easily sees even in disappointment a step which leads to a new hope when charmian entered to announce antony's body's slave she sent word to him to wait and requested her friend to accompany her to her son as they approached the apartments occupied by caesarion antyllus's loud voice reached them through the open door whose curtain was only half drawn the first word which the queen distinguished was her own name so motioning to her companion she stood still barine was again the subject of conversation antony's son was relating what alexis had told him cleopatra the syrian had asserted intended to send the young beauty to the mines or into exile and severely punish dion but both had made their escape the ephebi had behaved treacherously by taking sides with their foe but this was because they were not yet invested with their robes he hoped to induce his father to do this as soon as he shook off his pitiable misanthropy and he must also be persuaded to direct the pursuit of the fugitives this will not be difficult he cried insolently for the old man appreciates beauty and has himself cast an eye on the singer if they capture her i'll guarantee nothing you king of kings for spite of his grey beard he can cut us all out with the women and barine as we have heard doesn't think a man of much importance until his locks begin to grow thin i gave dercateus orders to send all his men in pursuit he's as cunning as a fox and the police are compelled to obey him if i were not forced to lie here like a dead donkey i would soon find her sighed caesarion night or day she is never out of my mind i have already spent everything i possessed in the search yesterday i sent for the steward seleucus what is the use of being my mother's son and the fat little fellow isn't specially scrupulous he will do nothing yet there must be gold enough the queen has sunk millions in the sand on the syrian frontier of the delta there is to be a square hole or something of the sort dug there to hide the fleet i only half understand the absurd plan the money might have paid hundreds of spies so talents are thrown away and the strong box is locked against the sun but i'll find one that will open to me i must have her though i risk the crown it always sounds like a jeer when they call me the king of kings i am not fit for sovereignty besides the throne will be seized ere i really ascend it we are conquered and if we succeed in concluding a peace which will secure us life and a little more we must be content for my part i shall be satisfied with a country estate on the water a sufficient supply of money and above all barine what do i care for egypt as caesar's son i ought to have ruled rome but the immortals knew what they were doing when they prompted my father to disinherit me to govern the world one must have less need of sleep really you know it i always feel tired even when i am well people must let me alone your father too antyllus is laying down his arms and letting things go as they will ah so he is cried antony's son indignantly but just wait the sleeping lion will wake again and when he uses his teeth and paws my mother will run away and your father will follow her replied caesarion with a melancholy smile wholly untinged by scorn all is lost but conquered kings and queens are permitted to live caesar's son will not be exhibited to the choirites in the triumphal procession rodon says that there would be an insurrection if i appeared in the forum if i go there again it certainly will not be in octavianus's train i am not suited for that kind of ignominy it would stifle me and ere i would grant any man the pleasure of dragging the son of caesar behind him to increase his own renown i would put an end ten nay a hundred times over in the good old roman fashion to my life which is by no means especially attractive what is sweeter than sound sleep 
and who will disturb and rouse me when death has lowered his torch before me but now i think i shall be spared this extreme whatever else they may inflict upon me will scarcely exceed my powers of endurance if any one has learned contentment it is i the king of kings and co-regent of the great queen has been trained persistently and with excellent success to be content what should i be and what am i yet i do not complain and wish to accuse no one we need not summon octavianus and when he is here let him take what he will if he only spares the lives of my mother the twins and little alexander whom i love and bestows on me the estate the main thing is that it must be full of fish-ponds of which i spoke the private citizen cesarian who devotes his time to fishing and the books he likes to read will gladly be allowed to choose a wife to suit his own taste the more humble her origin the more easily i shall win the consent of the roman guardian do you know cesarian interrupted antony's unruly son leaning back on the cushions and stretching his feet farther in front of him if you were not the king of kings i should be inclined to call you a base mean-natured fellow one who has the good fortune to be the son of julius caesar ought not to forget it so disgracefully my gall overflows at your whimpering by the dog it was one of my most senseless pranks to take you to the singer i should think there would be other things to occupy the mind of the king of kings besides barine cares no more for you than the last fish you caught she showed that plainly enough i say once more if dirk could Tius's men succeed in capturing the beauty who has robbed you of your senses she won't go with you to your miserable estate to cook the fish you catch for if we have her again and my father holds out his hand to her all your labour will be in vain he saw the fair enchantress only twice and had no time to become better acquainted but she captured his fancy and if i remind him of her who knows what will happen here cleopatra beckoned to her companion and returned to her apartments with drooping head on reaching them she broke the silence saying listening charmian is unworthy of a queen but if all listeners heard things so painful one need no longer guard keyholes and chinks of doors i must recover my calmness ere i receive arrows one thing more is barine's hiding-place secure i don't know archibius says so very well they are searching for her zealously enough as you heard and she must not be found i am glad that she did not set a snare for the boy how a jealous heart leads us astray were she here i would grant her anything to make amends for my unjust suspicion of her and antony and to think that alexis but for your interposition he would have succeeded meant to send her to the mines it is a terrible warning to be on my guard against whom first of all my own weakness this is a day of recognition a noble aim but on the way the feet bleed and the heart ah charming the poor weak disappointed heart she sighed heavily and supported her head on the arm resting upon the table at her side the polished exquisitely grained surface of thia wood was worth a large estate the gems in the rings and bracelets which glittered on her hand and arm would have purchased a principality this thought entered her mind and overpowered by a feeling of angry disgust she would fain have cast all the costly rubbish into the sea or the destroying flames she would gladly have been a beggar content with the barley bread of epicurus she said to herself if in return she could but have inspired her son even with the views of the reckless blusterer antyllus her worst fears had not pictured caesarion so weak so insignificant she could no longer rest upon her cushions and while with drooping head she gazed backward over the past the accusing voice in her own breast cried out that she was reaping what she had sowed 
she had repressed curbed the boy's awakening will to secure his obedience understood how to prevent any exercise of his ability or her efforts in wider circles true it had been done on many a pretext why should not her son taste the quiet happiness which she had enjoyed in the garden of epicurus and was not the requirement that whoever is to command must first learn to obey based upon old experiences but this was a day of reckoning and insight and for the first time she found courage to confess that her own burning ambition had marked out the course of caesarion's education she had not repressed his talents from cool calculation but it had been pleasant to her to see him grow up free from aspirations she had granted the dreamer repose without arousing him how often she had rejoiced over the certainty that this son on whom antony after his victory over the parthians had bestowed the title of co-regent would never rebel against his mother's guardianship the welfare of the state had doubtless been better secured in her trained hands than in those of an inexperienced boy and the proud consciousness of power her heart swelled so long as she lived she would remain queen to transfer the sovereignty to another whatever name he might bear had seemed to her impossible now she knew how little her son yearned for lofty things her heart contracted the saying you reap what you sowed gave her no peace and wherever she turned in her past life she perceived the fruit of the seeds which she had buried in the ground the field was sinking under the burden of the ears of misfortune the harvest was ripe for the reaper but ere he raised the sickle the owner's claim must be preserved gorgias must hasten the building of the tomb the end could not be long deferred how to shape this worthily if the victor left her no other choice had just been pointed out by the son of whom she was ashamed his father's noble blood forbade him to bear the deepest ignominy with the patience his mother had inculcated it had grown late ere she admitted antony's body slave but for her the business of the night was just commencing after he had gone she would be engaged for hours with the commanders of the army the fleet the fortifications the soliciting of allies too must be carried on by means of letters containing the most stirring appeals to the heart eros antony's body-slave appeared his kind eyes filled with tears at the sight of the queen grief had not lessened the roundness of his handsome face but the expression of mischievous often insolent gaiety had given place to a sorrowful droop of the lips and his fair hair had begun to turn grey lucilius's information that cleopatra had consented to make advances to antony had seemed like the rising of the sun after a long period of darkness in his eyes not only his master but everything else must yield to the power of the queen he had heard antony at tarsus inveigh against the egyptian serpent protesting that he would make her pay so dearly for her questionable conduct towards himself and the cause of caesar that the treasure-houses on the nile should be like an empty wine-skin yet a few hours after body and soul had been in her toils so it had continued till the battle of actium now there was nothing more to lose but what might not cleopatra bestow upon his master he thought of the delightful years during which his face had grown so round and every day fresh pleasures and spectacles such as the world would never again witness had satiated eye and ear palate and nostril nay even curiosity if they could be repeated even in a simpler form so much the better his main nay almost his sole desire was to release his lord from this wretched solitude this horrible misanthropy so ill suited to his nature cleopatra had kept him waiting two hours but he would willingly have loitered in the ante-room thrice as long if she only determined to follow his counsel it was worth considering and eros did not hesitate to give it no one could foresee how antony would greet cleopatra herself so he proposed that she should send charmian not alone but with her clever hunchbacked maid to whom the imperator himself had given the name isopian he liked charmian and could never see the dusky maid without jesting with her if his master could once be induced to show a cheerful face to others beside himself eros 
and perceived how much better it was to laugh than to lapse into sullen reverie and anger much would be gained and charmian would do the rest if she brought a loving message from her royal mistress hitherto cleopatra had not interrupted him but when she expressed the opinion that a slave's nimble tongue would have little power to change the deep despondency of a man overpowered by the most terrible disaster eros waved his short broad hand saying i trust your majesty will pardon the frankness of a man so humble in degree but those in high station often permit us to see what they hide from one another only the loftiest and the lowliest the gods and the slaves behold the great without disguise may my ears be cropped if the imperator's melancholy and misanthropy are so intense all this is a disguise which pleases him you know how in better days he enjoyed appearing as dionysus and with what wanton gaiety he played the part of the god now he is hiding his real cheerful face behind the mask of unsocial melancholy because he thinks the former does not suit this time of misfortune true he often says things which make your skin creep and frequently broods mournfully over his own thoughts but this never lasts long when we are alone if i come in with a very funny story and he doesn't silence me at once you can rely on his surpassing it with a still more comical one a short time ago i reminded him of the fishing party when your majesty had a diver fasten a salted herring on his hook you ought to have heard him laugh and exclaim what happy days those were the lady charmian need only remind him of them and isopian spiced the illusion with a jest i'll give my nose true it is only a small one but everybody values that feature most if they don't persuade him to leave that horrible crow's nest in the middle of the sea they must remind him of the twins and little alexander for when he permits me to talk about them his brow smooths most speedily he still speaks very often to lucilius and his other friends of his great plans of forming a powerful empire in the east with alexandria as its principal city his warrior blood is not yet calm a short time ago i was even ordered to sharpen the curved persian scimitar he likes to wield one could not know what service it might be he said then he swung his mighty arm by the dog the grey-haired giant still has the strength of three youths when he is once more with you among warriors and battle chargers all will be well let us hope so replied cleopatra kindly and promised to follow his advice when iris who had taken charmian's place accompanied the queen to her chamber after several hours of toil she found her silent and sad lost in thought she accepted her attendant's aid breaking her silence only after she had gone to her couch this has been a hard day iris she said it brought nothing save the confirmation of an old saying perhaps the most ancient in the world every one wilt reap only what he sows the plant which grows from the seed you place in the earth may be crushed but no power in the world will compel the seed to develop differently or produce fruit unlike what nature has assigned to it my seed was evil this now appears in the time of harvest but we will yet bring a handful of good wheat to the storehouses we will provide for that while there is time i will talk with gorgias early to-morrow morning while we were building you showed good taste and often suggested new ideas when gorgias brings the plans for the mausoleum you shall examine them with me you have a right to do so for if i am not mistaken few will visit the finished structure more frequently than my iris the girl started up and raising her hand as if taking a vow exclaimed your tomb will vainly wait my visit your end will be mine also may the gods preserve your youth from it replied the queen in a tone of grave remonstrance we still live and will do battle end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of cleopatra by georg ebers translated by mary j safford this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen 
night brought little sleep to cleopatra memory followed memory plan was added to plan the resolve made the day before was the right one to-day she would begin its execution whatever might happen she was prepared for every contingency ere she went to her work she granted a second audience to the roman envoy timagenes exerted all his powers of eloquence skill in persuasion wit and ingenuity he again promised to cleopatra life and liberty and to her children the throne but when he insisted upon the surrender or death of mark antony as the first condition of any further negotiations cleopatra remained steadfast and the ambassador set forth on his way home without any pledge after he had gone the queen and iris looked over the plans for the tomb brought by gorgias but the intense agitation of her soul distracted cleopatra's attention and she begged him to come again at a later hour when she was alone she took out the letters which caesar and antony had written to her how acute subtle and tender were those of the former how ardent impassioned yet sincere were those of the mighty and fiery orator whose eloquence swept the listening multitudes with him yet whom her little hand had drawn wherever she desired her heart throbbed faster when she thought of the meeting with antony now close at hand for charmian had gone with the nubian to invite him to join her again they had started several hours ago and she awaited their return with increasing impatience she had summoned him for their last mutual battle that he would come she did not doubt but could she succeed in rekindling his courage two persons so closely allied should sink and perish still firmly united in the final battle if victory was denied archibius was now announced it soothed her merely to gaze into the faithful countenance which recalled so many of her happiest memories she opened her whole soul to him without reserve and he drew himself up to his full height as if restored to youth while when she told him that she would never sully herself by treachery to her lover and husband and had resolved to die worthy of her name the expression of his eyes revealed that she had chosen the right path ere she had made the request that he should undertake the education and guidance of the children he voluntarily proposed to devote his best powers to them the plan of uniting didymus's garden with the locius and giving it to the little ones also met with his approval his sister had already told him that cleopatra had determined to build her tomb he hoped he added that its doors would not open to her for many years she shook her head sorrowfully exclaiming would that i could read every face as i do yours my friend archibius wishes me a long life if any one does but he is as wise as he is faithful and therefore will consider that earthly life is by no means a boon in every case besides he says to himself events are impending over this queen and woman my friend which will perhaps render it advisable to make use of the great privilege which the immortals bestow on human beings when it becomes desirable for them to leave the stage of life so let her build her tomb have i read the old familiar book aright on the whole yes he answered gravely but it is inscribed upon its pages that a great princess and faithful mother can be permitted to set forth on the last journey whence there is no return only when when she interrupted a shameful end threatens to fall upon the fair beginning and brilliant middle period as a swarm of locusts darkens the air and devours and devastates the fields i know it and will act accordingly and added archibius this end also faithful to your nature you will shape regally 
on my way here i met my sister near the coma you sent her to your husband he will grasp the proffered hand now that it is necessary to stake everything or surrender the grandson of heracles will again display his former heroic power perhaps stimulated and encouraged by the example of the woman he loves he will even force hostile fate to show him fresh favour destiny will pursue its course interrupted cleopatra firmly but antony must help me to heap fresh obstacles in the pathway and when he wishes to use his giant strength what masses of rock his mighty arm can hurl and if your lofty spirit smooths the path for him then my royal mistress even then the close of the tragedy will be death and every scene a disappointment was not the plan of bringing the fleet across the isthmus bold and full of promise even the professional engineers greeted it with applause and yet it proved impracticable destiny dug its grave and the terrible omens before and after actium and the stars the stars everything points to speedy destruction everything every hour brings news of the desertion of some prince or general as if from a watch-tower i now overlook what is now growing from the seed i sowed sterile ears or poisonous vegetation wherever i turn my eyes and yet you who know my life from its beginning tell me must i veil my head in shame when the question is asked what powers of intellect what talents industry and desire for good cleopatra displayed no my royal mistress a thousand times no yet the fruit of every tree i planted degenerated and decayed caesarion is withering in the flower of his youth by whose fault i know only too well you will now take charge of the education of the other children so it is for you to consider what brought me where i now stand and how to guard their life bark from wandering and shipwreck let me train them to be human beings replied archibius gravely and preserve them from the desire to enter the lists with the gods from the simple cleopatra in the garden of epicurus who was a delight to the good and wise you became the new isis to whom the multitude raised hearts eyes and hands dazzled and blinded we will transfer the twins helios and selene the sun and the moon from heaven to earth they must become mortals greeks i will not transplant them to the garden of epicurus but to another where the air is more bracing the inscription on its portal shall not be here pleasure is the chief good but this is an arena for character he who leaves this garden shall not owe it to the yearning for happiness and comfort but an immovably steadfast moral discipline your children like yourself were born in the east which loves what is monstrous superhuman exaggerated if you entrust them to me they must learn to govern themselves at the helm stands moral earnestness which however does not exclude the joyous cheerfulness natural to our people the sails will be trimmed by moderation the noblest quality of the greek nation i understand cleopatra interrupted with drooping head interwoven with the means of securing the children's welfare you set before the mother's eyes the qualities she has lacked i know that long ago you abandoned the teachings of epicurus and the stoa and with an earnest aim before your eyes sought your own paths the tempest of life swept me far away from the quiet garden where we sought the purest delight now i have learned to know the perils which threaten those who see the chief good in happiness it stands too high for mortals for in the changeful stir of life it remains unattainable and yet it is too low an aim for their struggles for there are worthier objects yet one saying of epicurus we both believed and it has always stood us in good stead 
wisdom can obtain no more precious contribution to the happiness of mortal life than the possession of friendship she held out her hand as she spoke and while deeply agitated he raised it to his lips she went on you know i am on the eve of the last desperate battle if the gods will shoulder to shoulder with antony therefore i shall not be permitted to watch your work of education yet i will aid it when the children question you about their mother you will be obliged to restrain yourself from saying instead of striving for the painless peace of mind the noble pleasure of epicurus which once seemed to her the highest good she constantly pursued fleeting amusements the oriental recklessly squandered her once noble gifts of intellect and the wealth of her people yielded to the hasty impulses of her passionate nature but you shall also say to them your mother's heart was full of ardent love she scorned what was base strove for the highest goal and when she fell preferred death to treachery and disgrace here she paused for she thought she heard footsteps approaching and then exclaimed anxiously i am waiting expecting perhaps antony cannot escape from the paralyzing grasp of despair to fight the last battle without him and yet under the gaze of his wrathful gloomy eyes once so full of sunshine would be the greatest sorrow of my life archibius i may confess this to you the friend who saw love for this man develop in the breast of the child but what does this mean an uproar have the people rebelled yesterday the representatives of the priesthood the members of the museum and the leaders of the army assured me of their changeless fidelity and love dion belonged to the macedonian men of the council yet i have already declared in accordance with the truth that i never intended to persecute him on caesarion's account i do not even know and do not desire to know the refuge of the lately wedded pair or has the new tax levied the command to seize the treasures of the temple driven them to extremities what am i to do we need gold to bind the foe defiance to preserve the independence of the throne the country and the people or have tidings from rome it is becoming serious and the noise is growing louder let me see what they want archibius anxiously interrupted hastening to the door but just at that moment the introducer opened it crying mark antony is approaching the locius attended by half alexandria the noble imperator is returning fell from the bearded lips of the commander of the guard ere the courtier's words had died away and even while he spoke iris pressed past him shrieking as if half frantic he is coming he is here i knew he would come how they are shouting and cheering out with you men if you are willing my royal mistress we will greet him from the balcony of berenike if we only had the twins little alexander interrupted cleopatra with blanched face and faltering voice put on their festal garments quick the children zoe cried iris completing the order and clapping her hands then she turned to the queen with the entreaty be calm my royal mistress be calm i beseech you we have ample time here is the vulture crown of isis and here the other antony's slave eros has just come in panting for breath the imperator he says will appear as the new dionysus it would certainly please his master though he had not commissioned him to request it if you greeted him as the new isis help me hathor nephorus tell the usher to see that the fan bearers and the other attendants women and men are in their places here are the pearl and diamond necklaces for your throat and bosom take care of the robe the transparent bombyx is as delicate as a cobweb and if you tear it no you must not refuse we all know how it pleases him to see his goddess in divine majesty and beauty 
cleopatra with glowing cheeks and throbbing heart made no further objection to donning the superb festal robe strewn with glimmering pearls and glittering gems it would have been more in harmony with her feelings to meet the returning antony in the plain dark garb which since her arrival at home she had exchanged for a richer one only on festal occasions but antony was coming as the new dionysus and eros knew what would please his master eight nimble hands which were often aided by iris's skilful fingers toiled busily and soon the latter could hold up the mirror before cleopatra exclaiming from the very depths of her heart like the foam-born aphrodite and the golden haythor then iris who in adorning her beloved mistress had forgotten love hate and envy and amid her eager haste barely found time for a brief fervent prayer for a happy issue of this meeting through the broad folding doors as wide as if she were about to reveal to the worshippers in the temple the image of the god in the innermost sanctuary a long echoing shout of surprise and delight greeted the queen for the courtiers hastily summoned were already awaiting her without from the grey-haired epistolograph to the youngest page regally attired women in her service raised the floating train of her cloak others in sacerdotal robes were testing the ease of movement of the rings on the sistrum rods men and boys were forming into lines according to the rank of each individual and the chief fanbearer gave the signal for departure after a short walk through several halls and corridors the train reached the first courtyard of the palace and there ascended the few steps leading to the broad platform at the entrance gate which overlooked the whole bruchium and the street of the king down which the expected hero would approach the distant uproar of the multitude had sounded threatening but now amid the deafening din they could distinguish every shout of welcome every joyous greeting every expression of delight surprise applause admiration and homage known to the greek and egyptian tongues only the centre and end of the procession were visible the head had reached the corner of the muses where concealed by the old trees in the garden it moved on between the temple of isis and the land owned by didymus the end still extended to the coma whence it had started all alexandria seemed to have joined it men large and small of high and low degree old and young the lame and the crippled mingled with the throng sweeping onward among horses and carriages carts and beasts of burden like a mountain torrent dashing wildly down to the valley here a loud shriek rang from an overturned litter whose bearers had fallen yonder a child thrown to the ground screamed shrilly there a dog trodden under the feet of the crowd howled piteously so clear and resonant were the shouts of joy that they rose high above the flutes and tambourines the cymbals and lutes of the musicians who followed the man approaching in the robes of a god the head of the procession now passed beyond the corner of the muses and came within view of the platform there could be no doubt to whom this ovation was given for the returning hero was in the van high above all the other figures from the golden throne borne on the shoulders of twelve black slaves he waved his long thyrsus and greeting to the exulting multitude before the bacchanalian train which accompanied him and behind the musicians who followed moved two elephants bearing between them as a light burden some unrecognizable object covered with a purple cloth now the column had passed between the pylons through the lofty gateway which separated the palace from the street of the king and stopped opposite to the platform while officials scythians and bodyguards of all shades of complexion on foot and on horseback kept back the throng by force where friendly warning did not avail cleopatra saw her lover descend from the throne and give a signal to the indian slave who guided the elephants the cloth was flung aside revealing to the astonished eyes of the spectators a bouquet of flowers such as no alexandrian had ever beheld 
it consisted entirely of blossoming rose bushes the red flowers formed a circle in the centre surrounded by a broad light garland of white ones the whole gigantic work rested like an egg in its cup in a holder of palm fronds which as it were framed it in graceful curving outlines more than a thousand blossoms were united in this peerless bouquet and the singular gigantic gift was characteristic of its giver he advanced on foot to the platform his figure towering above the brown light-hued and black freedmen and slaves who followed as on the monuments of the pharaohs the image of the sovereign dominates those of the subjects and foes he could look down upon the tallest men and the width of his shoulders was as remarkable as his colossal height a long gold-broidered purple mantle floating to his ankles increased his apparent stature powerful arms with the swelling muscles of an athlete were extended from his sleeveless robe towards the beloved queen the well-formed head thick dark hair and magnificent beard corresponded with the powerful figure formerly these locks had adorned the head of the youth with the blue black hue of the raven's plumage now the threads of grey scattered abundantly through them were concealed by the aid of dye a thick wreath of vine leaves rested on the imperator's brow and leafy vine branches to which clung several dark bunches of grapes fell over his broad shoulders and down his back which was covered like a cloak not by a leopard skin but that of a royal indian tiger of great size he had slain it himself in the arena the head and paws of the animal were gold the eyes two magnificent sparkling sapphires the clasp of the chain by which the skin was suspended as well as that of the gold belt which circled the imperator's body above the hips was covered with rubies and emeralds the wide armlets above his elbows the ornaments on his broad breast nay even his red morocco boots glittered and flashed with gems radiant magnificence as his former fortune seemed the attire of this mighty fallen hero who but yesterday had shrunk timidly and sadly from the eyes of his fellow-men his features too were large noble and beautiful in outline but though his pale cheeks were adorned with the borrowed crimson of youth half a century of the maddest pursuit of pleasure and the torturing excitement of the last few weeks had left traces only too visible for the skin hung in loose bags beneath the large eyes wrinkles furrowed his brow and radiated in slanting lines from the corners of his eyes across his temples yet not one of those whom this bedizened man of fifty was approaching thought of seeing in him an aged bedecked dandy it was an instinct of his nature to surround himself with pomp and splendour and moreover his whole appearance was so instinct with power that scorn and mockery shrank abashed before it how frank gracious and kindly was this man's face how sincere the heartfelt emotion which sparkled in his eyes still glowing with the fire of youth at the sight of the woman from whom he had been so long parted every feature beamed with the most ardent tenderness for the royal wife whom he was approaching and the expression on the lips of the giant varied so swiftly from humble sorrowful anguish of mind to gratitude and delight that even the hearts of his foes were touched but when pressing his hand on his broad breast he advanced towards the queen bending so low that it seemed as if he would fain kiss her feet when in fact the colossal figure did sink kneeling before her and the powerful arms were outstretched with fervent devotion like a child beseeching help the woman who had loved him throughout her whole life with all the ardour of her passionate soul was overpowered by the feeling that everything which stood between them all their mutual offences had vanished he saw the sunny smile that brightened her beloved ever beautiful face and then then his own name reached his ears from the lips to which he owed the greatest bliss 
love had ever offered at last as if intoxicated by the tones of her voice which seemed to him more musical than the songs of the muses half smiling at the jest which even in the most serious earnest he could not abandon half moved to the depths of his soul by the power of his newly awakening happiness after such sore sorrow he pointed to the gigantic bouquet which three slaves had lifted down from the elephant and were bearing to the queen cleopatra too was overwhelmed with emotion this floral gift imitated on an immense scale the little bouquet which the famous young general had taken from her father's hand before the gate of the garden of epicurus to present to her as his first gift that had also been composed of red roses surrounded by white ones instead of palm fronds it had been encircled only by fern leaves this was one of the beautiful offerings which antony's gracious nature so well understood how to choose the bouquet was a symbol of the unprecedented generosity natural to this large-minded man no magic goblet had compelled him to approach her thus and with such homage nothing had constrained him save his overflowing heart his constant fadeless love as if restored to youth transported by some magic spell to the happy days of early girlhood she forgot her royal dignity and the hundreds of eyes which rested upon him as if spellbound and obedient to an irresistible impulse of the heart she sank upon the broad heaving breast of the kneeling hero laughing joyously in the clear silvery tones which are usually heard only in youth he clasped her in his strong arms raised her slender figure in its floating royal mantle from the ground kissed her lips and eyes held her aloft in the soaring attitude of the goddess of victory as if to display his happiness to the eyes of all and at last placed her carefully on her feet again like some treasured jewel then turning to the children who were waiting at their mother's side he lifted first little alexander then the twins to kiss them and while holding helios and selene in his arms as if the joy of seeing them again had banished their weight the shouts which had arisen when the queen sank on his breast again burst forth the ancient walls of the lochias palace had never heard such acclamations they passed from lip to lip from hundreds to hundreds and though those more distant did not know the cause they joined in the shouts along the whole vast stretch from the lochias to the coma the cheers rang out like a single heart-stirring inseparable cry echoing across the harbour the ships lying at anchor the towering masts to the cliff amid the sea where barine was nursing her new-made husband End of chapter nineteen